parts. The central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is basically stuff that comes out off of those and goes to the rest of the body. Okay, so this is the central nervous system. We haven't seen the brain yet, but we've seen the bits of the spinal cord down here. Okay, and obviously they are connected because all these nerves that are going to peripheral areas of the body um, come out of either the brain or parts of the spinal cord. Okay, when we move to the peripheral nervous system, um, we've talked about two groups of structures which have sort of separate types of nerves going to them. There's the somatic nerves, which are going to striated voluntary muscles uh, in the body wall or in the arms and legs. Uh, and then the, well, the somatic muscle, uh, somatic motor. And the somatic stuff, if you will, it contains both sensory information, okay, so the somatic sensory, that's what we saw, um, well, we'll get to where it comes from, but you, you, you obviously see it in the, uh, in the dorsal roots. And then there is somatic motor, which I say, which is going to voluntary muscle. Okay, then there's the visceral system, and in terms of its cardiac muscle, smooth muscle and glands, which have motor information going to them, okay? And then there is visceral sensory. And in contrast to somatic sensory, in, in somatic sensory, if you cut your finger, you know pretty well what you cut. It's pretty clear. You can feel a pain or you can feel burning if you put your finger under a, on a stove or something like that. Visceral pain tends to be duller um, and, and harder to locate. And we've talked about why there's, there's problems and why you get things like uh, referred pain. Okay, so the, the somatic system, which is sort of what we're mostly familiar with, and then there's the visceral system, which we're less familiar with, but you know, we, we have all had stomach aches or, or problems, muscle cramps and things like that. Okay, so the visceral motor, okay, is basically the autonomic nervous system, which has two parts, okay, sympathetic and parasympathetic. <coughs> and they have different characteristics, they tend to do opposing things, and they come from different places and get from the central nervous system to the other parts of the body through very different pathways. And that's what we're just going to go through all this step by step by step by step by step by step. Okay, our old friend, the spinal cord. <laughs> okay, this is a part of the central nervous system, right? Remember the central nervous system was brain and the spinal cord going all the way down the body. And we know the parts of these, da da, which you all remember from your exam that first quiz. So here's the cord itself. Here's the dorsal horn, which is where sensory information is coming into. The ventral horn, where motor information is coming from. Okay, and then there's this intermediolateral column out there, or this little thing poking out, which is referred to as the lateral horn. And that's related to the sympathetic innervation. You have a dorsal root, which is involved with the sensory information, a ventral root, which is involved with motor information, motor information from there and motor information coming from there. These are the dorsal roots and ventral roots. They come together to form a spinal nerve, and that spinal nerve, as you'll see in the future slides, divides into rami. So these are roots, these are rami. This is viewed as a tree, right? The, the first part that's coming out of the ground is the root, then the spinal nerve is the trunk, and these are the branches of some ancient anatomy's demented mind. Okay, so spinal nerves, our friends the spinal nerves. Realize that there's some sort of screwy things going on here. 
Um, there's eight cervical spinal nerves, even though there's only seven cervical vertebrae. So in the cervical region, okay, the C1 comes out above the first vertebra, C2 comes out above the second cervical vertebra, C3 comes about above the third, and so forth and so on. C7 comes out above the seventh cervical vertebrae, and C8 comes out below the seventh cervical vertebrae. So they're not, they're, they're not aligned there. Most of them are above a cervical vertebrae, but C8's under. From there on down, the spinal nerves come out below the vertebrae with the same number. So that T1 comes out below the T1 vertebrae, T2, T3, T4, blah, 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 all the way down to the coccyx. So there are eight cervical nerves, even though there are seven cervical vertebrae. Okay, 12 thoracic nerves and 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar nerves and five lumbar vertebrae, five sacral, one coccygeal nerves, and there may be two or three little vertebrae all fused together. But realize there's a disjunction up here at the bottom of the cervical and top of the thoracic region. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, when you're in an embryonic stage, there is the, the spinal cord is, is sort of bent into what's called a kyphosis. Okay, it's sort of bent over like that. As you grow into adulthood, you get different curves. You retain that primary kyphosis in the thoracic region, but then you get the reverse curvature, a lordosis in the, thora in the lumbar region and a little bit of lordosis up here in the cervical region. So these things change during embryology. The spinal cord changes during growth. Um, as an embryo, things are pretty much the way they should be, right? So that the T1 roots come out pretty much right after the first thoracic vertebrae, the T2 roots and the roots that are going to form all these spinal nerves, pretty much come out of the spinal cord and come straight out the intervertebral foramina between the individual vertebrae. But as you get older, the vertebral column gets relatively longer compared to the growth of the spinal cord. So that as you know, so that for example, the T7 nerve will come out of the spinal cord of vertebrae and a half higher, travel down, beneath the dura, and then come out at T7, T8 will form a little higher, until you reach this situation down in the upper lumbar region, where the spinal cord is ended, but all the roots that are going to go out through lower lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal nerves have already formed, and there's no more cord itself, and this is what leads to that cauda equina. So from everything being perfectly lined up in embryo, it ends up that the cord, when you're an adult, is much shorter uh, than the actual length of the vertebrae. So that's how you get all these roots that are just hanging out, waiting for a place to escape. And then finally, you have this phylum terminale, which comes off at the end and travels all the way down. Okay, this upper part here is still within the dural sac, and then the lower part is, is outside of that. So that's just connective tissue going on down. Okay, the same thing that we showed before with a few extra details. Okay, so again, here's our dorsal horn, and sensory information is coming into that. There's a dorsal root ganglion here. Okay, when these, the sensory coming back and the motor going out come together to form the spinal nerve. So this only contains sensory information coming from the body going into the spinal cord where it's read and passed up to the brain to say, hey, something happened to the tip of your finger. This is motor information which starts here, goes out through the air, and goes out and tells you to move that finger, that muscle in your finger um, to get away from the fire or whatever. The spinal nerve here is the first place where the sensory and motor information comes together, and from there the axons travel out so that the dorsal ramus has both motor and sensory, the ventral ramus has both motor and sensory, 
and so forth. In the dural sac there, there is this thing called the denticulate ligament, which is an extension of the pia matter, which actually comes out and attaches to the dura out here. And it generally separates, you can often find it, it separates the dorsal root, which comes out above it, and the ventral root, which comes out below it. So if we pin one of those little denticulate ligament, you can identify the dorsal root because it's above it, and the ventral root are underneath it. Sometimes that's hard to see because these guys get torn and ripped, but that's the way they should be aligned. So our typical spinal nerve, okay, here's the, you know, dorsal roots and ventral roots coming together from a nerve. There's your dorsal root ganglion. And there's the dorsal ramus, which is only innervating this stuff on a few inches either side of the middle of the back, containing both motor and sensory. And then there's this big ventral ramus, which comes out, containing again both motor and sensory, and wrapping all the way around, sending branches out there, coming all the way around, branches out here, and typical thoracic spinal nerve. We'll get to this a little later, but this, this, these typical spinal nerves in the thoracic region are also have some sympathetic fibers that come out through the ventral root and go over here and have white rami going into these sympathetic chain where they may either synapse there and send a gray ramus out, or they may go up a few notches and synapse there and send a gray ramus coming out. Know this. These dermatomes, which we've shown you off and on throughout the course, and you've seen them in your books and atlases, are just maps of areas of skin, dermo, like dermatoglyphics, fingerprints, dermatologists. These are maps of what areas of the body are innervated by nerves from individual spinal levels. And you'll see in the thorax, it's, you know, it's all pretty much just like a fish. Everything's layer, 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 all really cool, layer, layer, layer. But once you get into the arms and legs, it gets a little, they get stretched out. So the arm up here picks up innervation from lower part of the cervical region. So there's some C5, there's some C4, there's some C6, C7, C8, and T1. And so the, the nerves, actually those are the nerves that come out of this thing called the brachial plexus, which you'll see, and innervate the muscles in this area. And likewise, their sensory components innervate the skin in this area. And likewise in the legs. The innervation of the legs comes from mostly lumbar and sacral and upper sacral segments. And so you see the dermatomes down here are sort of wrapped around the legs. Okay. Here it's all very linear and straightforward. They get a little stretched. So with lumbar on the front of the leg and sacral's coming out on the back. And we will follow these out as we just talk about innervation of different parts of the body. Um, okay, so a spinal nerve, right? So here is our dorsal horn and ventral horn, and then they're both coming together to form your spinal nerve. The, the roots are going together to form the nerves. And the dorsal ramus has sensory information and motor, and the dorsal ramus over here is going to that part of the body. The ventral ramus, which is shown here much bigger because it's doing everything else, all the stuff from the sides all the way around to the front, plus the limbs, which are part of the, this lower area, this hypaxial area, whereas this area is referred to as the epaxial, because they're innervated by dorsal rami. This is just showing you the same thing in terms of muscles that you are familiar with um, from our early dissections. So here's the dorsal ramus going just to that area on either side of the spine, and innervating these muscles. And the same when you get up to the back of the head. Okay, the ventral rami are coming out and they're doing all the other muscles. They're doing all the intercostal muscles in the ribs. They're doing, the, you'll see next week, the muscles of the belly. They're gonna do the muscles of the arm, the muscles of the shoulder, the muscles of the legs, 
and so forth. Yes? So um, the dorsorami, that's for the muscles in the back. Does that also include like the serratus posterior? Even no. The no, it's just, just, those just these guys here. Box. Okay. Just the deep back muscles. Serratus is, is essentially an arm muscle, uh, and as is uh, trapezius is another story we won't talk about that. Okay, so here we are back again. We've talked about distribution of the PNS, so this somatic motor and somatic sensory. Again, the motor is concerned with striated voluntary muscles, you know, the ones that move your arm, the ones that enable you to bend over, and the other tissues. Uh, again, somatic sensory, as I said, if you cut your finger, you know what you've cut, and somatic motor goes to specific muscles or specific. Uh, okay, a few other words that pop up. A ganglia is a collection of cell bodies that is outside of the central nervous system. When we get to the abdomen, you'll find ganglia all up and down the uh, middle of the body. You remember, we, there are also ganglia, okay, in, in, in many other parts of the body. A nerve plexus uh, is where a variety of nerves come together, mix it up, and send something out the other side uh, that is not just a single nerve, but some sort of mixture. Um, Okay, we saw a cardiac plexus, uh, pulmonary plexus, these things that have both sympathetic and parasympathetics, mixing it up and then traveling out to the individual organs. And when we get to arms and legs, very briefly, uh, we'll run into things like the brachial plexus, which is a bunch of motor nerves that are going to come together. Instead of being C5, C6, C7, they're going to be the, you know, the, the ulnar nerve or the radial nerve. Ganglia can take place within a plexus. So among these mixed up nerves, there can often be ganglia within them. And a synapse is a junction where basically one axon talks to another. Information is transferred from one axon to another, or an axon to a cell, a muscle cell or a gland cell. So gang, gang, uh, synapse are, are junctions. Okay, neuron types. Somatic motor neurons, they have their cell bodies in the central nervous system, in the spinal cord. There's this long 